Okay, so in this last part then, we're going to talk about how to set up a program for, um, say, an aging program in your lab. Uh, basically, it's a protocol or a standardized uh, suite of instructions or, or, or a way of doing things that's going to improve the quality of aging that you do. So it's talking about things like setting up a, a standardized technique. You know, how are we going to take the samples? How are we going to process them? How are we going to light them? Getting that technique down, then validating it with known age fish or validating the annuli, anything you need to do to validate the accuracy. Um, coming up with a reference collection. So having um, a collection of structures for which you, you know the age or they've been expert age or something that you can use periodically to test the quality and do quality control. And so we're going to talk about some different strategies that you can do within your lab to try to ensure that you're getting the best uh, aging of your fish. Um, the, this thing I want to talk about now is your aging program. Um, basically, if you're in a lab and you're working with fish all the time, you want to have sort of an aging protocol that you use to ensure the most uh, precision and accuracy. And so this is from Campana 2001. This is their suggestion or his suggestion. The first is to develop a standardized aging method. And so that's to develop your technique and clearly understand and make it very clear all the different ways that you're going to prepare the structure and you're going to look at the structure under the microscope. Once you have your standardized aging method, you need to do age validation to validate that this technique actually works. You then need to prepare a reference collection. And so this is going to be a collection of known age fish that you can keep and that you can use um, later on to test, uh, to validate and, and to test precision for other readers. And you need some sort of quality control monitoring. So you don't want to get into the habit of um, just aging fish all the time without ever sort of going back and double checking. You know, bad habits can creep into your your aging and uh, you don't want that to happen. So you want to have some sort of, uh, you know, every six months or so, have some sort of quality control monitoring to make sure everyone is still um, keeping with the program, as it were. Now this reference collection, um, again, is very important but also very difficult to get. Um, you want something that spans all age classes, all sizes, all environments, all seasons. Basically you want to have a really good collection of structures that represents the whole suite of exposure that your fish can have. And then you want these to be known age ideally but you can get by with expert aged. Uh, ultimately if we can't validate the aging for a lot of these fish, we're going to have to accept the fact that that over time if enough experts look at them, sort of fisheries professionals agree that this this fish is, you know, age two and this fish is age three. At any rate, um, you need something to give that that age estimate some level of validity. Um, and it also helps if you've got this reference collection to have some sort of exchange program. So instead of your lab always using the same structures, it's very helpful to maybe trade with other labs. Again, just to have fish from a wider range of age classes and sizes, but also so that you don't kind of get, you know, used to the test and, and where you start recognizing the same structures again. This would be the best way for quality control. There are lots of ways you can exchange your reference collection. Of course, it's pretty simple. Just put them in a box and mail them back and forth. But also, if you have good enough digital images, you can just um, exchange digital images. Now, I don't don't care for that too much because, in my experience, the digital image never looks as good as the image through the microscope. And so, you always want to trust what you see through the microscope over what you see on the digital image. Now for quality control, um, the best way to do this is to take that reference collection and periodically 
you want to age a subsample of this collection intermixed with your current samples. So you don't want to say, hey everybody, today's the day we're going to check our, our reference collection and you're going to be tested on it. That means people are going to pay more attention, they're going to, they're going to work a little harder, you don't want anything like that. And so the best way to do this is to secretly slip in uh, sa samples from your reference collection and then see what age people give those samples. And then of course you're going to monitor with bias plots and the coefficient of variation to look at, at uh, precision and if they're known age or, or compared to the, the age that you've given that, you can look at people's accuracy. And so that is um, a strategy that's recommended for any kind of aging program. Now, um, Texas came up with a, they have a very strict protocol that they use that they've had a lot of success with. And it begins with a two-hour training workshop learning the aging technique. Then the person practices on unknown, unknown fish until they feel comfortable. And then they have 50 known age fish that they've been, this is a collection of, of largemouth bass, I know for sure that they've been keeping and kind of slowly accumulating these otoliths from known age fish over years. And then they measure the accuracy, precision, and bias. And, and an individual has to um, reach a certain level of accuracy and precision before they're allowed to actually age fish uh, in the lab. Other strategies that have had success in improving the quality of aging involve uh, multiple readers, and this is typical of just about anyone, of, of any lab that ages fish, is that you never have just one person reading them. Um, and so this essentially is that, that two or more readers look at the structure, and if they don't agree, then either you bring in a third reader, and if you, and then whichever person that that one agrees with, um, then you go with that age. Or if they don't agree, then you just throw that one out. Um, or if you have two readers and they don't agree, then they um, try and reach a consensus uh, to where they will argue about it and and look at it together and and. Um, ultimately try to decide on what the actual age is going to be. Of course, you can clearly see the problem there. The, the stronger, more stubborn personality is often going to get their way. However, it has been shown to increase the percent correct dramatically, and um, this is sort of the de facto way of doing aging, that you have at least two readers on everything. Um, you have the possibility to make this internet-based, if you are just using digital images, but again, I would say trust, you know, you, you always want to work at the microscope versus at the computer. Um, another thing that, that people do to try to improve their aging is to use support information. For example, the length. And so if you're trying to decide what the age of this fish is, some people will go ahead and look at the length and then help them make the decision for them or help them make the decision. Um, you, again, you can see the problem with that, right? It's kind of a circular argument. You're talking about age and growth, and then you're, you're looking at the growth to help you determine the age. Um, I, I think that sometimes this really has the potential to throw in a lot of bias, and so I don't like it. I think you're much better off ignoring supplemental information, and, um, and if you can't get a, a consensus on a particular otolith, just you know, try and throw it out or or improve your technique until you can get a consensus on these fish. Um, you're already going to have, you can't avoid some supplemental information. I mean, if you look at an otolith from an eight-year-old fish, you know it's an old fish. It's a big old gnarly thick otolith. You know that's not a young fish. And so that's going to creep in and it's inevitable. But as far as using the actual length of the fish, I'm not crazy about that. Um, Finally, there's um, other things people have tried. For example, computer-based aging. Uh, Caliette et al. came out with this program called Bony Parts. Um, we've messed around with using Image J. Basically, what you do is, is it looks at an image of your hard part, and um, it looks at the color distribution, a histogram of the color distribution, and where you see clear breaks in the color, that's sort of where your your annulus is showing up, and and it. Put an, uh, apply an algorithm to try to have the computer pick out those areas where there's a, 
a clear change in color which would represent um, an annulus. These don't seem to work very well. Uh, it depends entirely upon the quality of the picture and you know the human eye is usually just as good at picking these things out versus a computer. Now on certain species you know that are very old, they, that are very old it might be better but for most of our aging um, it just doesn't work very well. So uh, I want to convince you that uh, you know, improving the quality of your aging is essential to being a good fish manager. Aging is so important to what we do um, and we need to be aware of the quality of our aging and, and I've given you several ways that you can try to maintain the quality and, and to at least check your quality and some strategies for having a good uh, aging 